Welcome everyone to Creating Value, Assessing the Return on Investment in Complete Streets, a webinar of the National Complete Streets Coalition, a program of Smart Growth America. This is the second installment in our monthly webinar series, Implementation and Equity 201, The Path Forward to Complete Streets. The series is designed to help professionals from a variety of disciplines put complete streets principles into action and create safer, healthier, and more equitable streets. Today's webinar is co-hosted by Scott Lane of Stantec. The presentation will include how to use cost-benefit analyses to demonstrate the value of complete streets and what advocates can do to make complete streets a higher priority in state and local budgets. I'm Deborah Alvarez, the Vice Chair of the Executive Committee of the National Complete Streets Steering Committee. My day job is Federal Transportation Lobbyist for AARP. I'm here to provide a brief introduction to today's webinar before handing it over to Scott. I'll also be moderating our question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So please type your questions in the ReadyTalk chat box. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the National Complete Streets Coalition's blog. When we talk about return on investment for complete streets, we really want to know what you get for your investment. Uh, as you can see on the slide, the return on investment in complete streets includes multiple elements, uh, economic, environmental, health, safety, and livability. Last month's webinar in our series focused on the health return on investment for complete streets, and today's presentation focuses specifically on the economic return on investment and how to monetize some of the other returns on investment, or ROIs. Last year, Smart Growth America released a report called Safer Streets, Stronger Economies. It looked at the impact of 37 Complete Streets projects around the country. The report found that Complete Streets are safer, which not only saves lives, but also saves money. In just one year, those Complete Streets avoided $18.1 million in collisions and injury costs. These projects also stimulated the economy. They increased employment levels, property values, private sector investment, and new businesses. Calculating the value created by Complete Streets projects can be a very powerful tool to leverage funding for these projects. Complete Streets are far less expensive than other transportation projects. They can be undertaken at very little cost in conjunction with roadway repairs and maintenance and even at this low cost, they can still have enormous impacts on health, safety, and the local economy. As the graph shows, 74% of the Complete Streets projects examined in the report cost less than one, less per mile than the average arterial road project. In fact, Portland was even able to build a 300-mile bicycle network for the same cost as just one mile of urban freeway. Not only can you deliver Complete Streets projects with the funding you have or for very little more, by implementing Complete Streets, you're also creating investments that pay dividends. Being able to calculate the return on investment for Complete Streets can be a very powerful tool to leverage funding for these projects by making them more competitive for grants and by encouraging elected officials and decision makers to make them a higher priority in state and local budgets. Scott Lane joins us today to share his knowledge and insight on how benefit cost analyses can capture the return on investment for complete streets. Scott is a senior community planner at Stantec. He has 25 years of planning and policy development experience, including directing metropolitan planning organizations and serving as a senior project manager with Stantec Consulting. He has extensive experience in municipal, regional, and national planning and policy matters including having served as the executive director of three MPOs, principal investigator for NCHRP and FHWA research projects, and conductor of several economic impact analyses. Scott has conducted corridor, area, and comprehensive plan studies for every mode of travel. He has also written numerous papers, won several APA awards, and made many presentations on metropolitan planning, policy, financing, and land use Transportation Connections. Scott, thank you for your presentation. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Smart Growth America and National Complete Streets Coalition. It's really exciting talking about a topic that I know we at Stantec and certainly I've been getting more and more involved with. It seems to be something that people want to talk about, want to do more. 
uh, of. So um, this presentation is kind of getting us into a place where we can think about uh, some of the main missions of uh, the National Complete Streets Coalition. This is actually from the website um, here, uh, defining what complete streets are. You get extra points if you can figure out who the guy is on the motorcycle. Um, and uh, really, as you mentioned, Deborah, this is a way of kind of tying a lot of other kind of benefits together in, in ways that uh, hopefully make sense to people. So that's James Dean, by the way. Um, here are the folks that we're trying to benefit, and many times they have concerns and issues and things that uh, uh, they approach us with, and you know we're just trying to, to do our project and do it as best we can, and sometimes they, they give us things that are difficult to understand how to, how to assess, and there's uh, always, always trade-offs. But uh, economics kind of help us a little bit think about those trade-offs, and it has other benefits too, I think. Uh, Certainly leveling the playing field with other kinds of competing issues. There's always competing issues happening um, uh, both within our project and within a decision-making or funding body like a city or a state or the federal government. So understanding how those decisions get made and, and hopefully putting our project in a good light is important. Uh, I mentioned the diverse perspectives. Um, uh, National Complete Streets and Smart Growth America are very interested in the social equity issues surrounding uh, that topic. Um, and I think that uh, one of the interesting things is here that we'll talk about a little bit in the beginning is how economics isn't just about the dollars, it's also about the community. And then definition and um, bringing even more financial support to your project, which is always a, a nice benefit. This will be about me. I always like to tell people who I am. I'm really uh, not an economist. I, I cringe whenever I hear that uh, term applied to me a little bit. but. I'm certainly doing a lot more of this kind of return on investment work as part of our projects and include long-range transportation planning and corridor planning. Uh, I've also become interested in looking at crime prevention through design. Uh, I'm a certified expert on that. And more specifically and more relevant, I guess, is you know, done a lot of grant work, done a lot of uh, returns on investment for specific projects for different kinds of purposes. Many of you on the line probably have uh, taking a look at things like the, the Tiger Grant Program, uh, Fastlane, and many others that are uh, both local and national that uh, concern themselves in part with you know, returns on investment. And so um, all those things are, are kind of leading us to and leading me to, to focus a little bit more on this topic. What economics is all about? Look how happy she is, right? So um, really, the reason we get into this, or I've gotten into this more and more often, is that we seem to see the same things happening in some of our projects. Uh, we all know very well uh, what we're doing in terms of our own expertise, our own training, but oftentimes when we go into the community, their concerns are quite different than our, 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 our comfort area kind of defines. So we're trying to find a way to, to uh, assess and understand and, and feed back all of these issues we run into out into the real world. Um, another reason is that before we can often talk about complete streets or, or walkable communities or sustainable communities or bikeable communities, uh, many people want to talk about other things that are more near and dear to them, uh, access to jobs, access to job training, schools, um, uh, all kinds of things that they, they want to understand and how their pro this project can, can become their project. And I think this topic and this issue of return on investment is one pathway to make that happen for communities. So who's complete? Um, this presentation, if you were lucky enough to be at the National Complete Streets Coalition's first, I think it was the first uh, annual conference in Sacramento, California. Um, this presentation was a, is a takeoff and more detailed version of that one. We went over at that conference and in this presentation about you know, how this topic has evolved over time. Um, I'm not old enough to remember back into the 60s, but I know that you know big regional mobility, interstates, and things were certainly we were spending a lot of time and effort. Then, as we progressed into the 80s and 90s, we're looking more at you know, urban and local mobility. And then 2000s, you know, the, the knots, uh, we were thinking about satisfying multimodal users, and that's kind of where we're at now. But I think as we move forward, all those things will still be important. But even more than that, perhaps, is you know a kind of a sense of place and understanding present a really complete, robust picture. Of, um, uh, of our communities and, and how our project fits into them. Um, performance, security, and return on investment are three areas that you know, I focused on in the past, but I think 
as we've said before already, that return on investment has kind of this ability, potentially, to tie some of these things together. Uh, all of these things are concerns and interests that we sometimes bump into as we go out in the communities and we're not quite sure how to handle them, we're not comfortable about it. One thing I do want to mention is that, you know, uh, as I said, I'm not an economist, and even probably the most famous economist also was not an economist, Adam Smith. Uh, he of the um, uh, invisible hand of the free market uh, sort of uh, thought about economics as a moral philosophy. Economics isn't the dismal science that people think about. Hopefully your presentation today will prove that to you a little bit. But um, uh, Adam uh, really thought that morality is the big reason to look at economics and social equity kinds of issues. How's the best way to, or what is the best way to improve the lot of your fellow man? And um, I, I think people tend to overlook that a little bit uh, depending on their uh, idea of spin, I guess, for, for economics. But uh, one of the earlier philosophers uh, that are still deemed contemporary certainly viewed it as a kind of a moral imperative to understand how economics helps people. Another thing that I think is important for my, to understand where I'm coming from with economics is that it's not about the dollar bills in your purse or your wallet. Uh, that money is simply a way of attaching value to something. It's, uh, it's no different than the island of Yap uh, years ago that used large stones with holes in the center to represent money in dollars. The bigger ones were so heavy uh, and so valuable that they never moved. It was just understanding that they exchanged places. These days, of course, we have even more abstract kinds of things like Bitcoin uh, that doesn't exist in the real world at all. Um, in all these cases, uh, money is simply the vehicle that carries our values, our wishes, our hopes, our dreams. Um, and it's a way of helping uh, make some hard decisions as economics. Most of the things we deal with, we get stymied because there is an issue with understanding what success means. And uh, one of our philosophies here at Stantec is understanding what the community the client and others want to get out of the projects, then we do get down the road into the trade-off areas. Uh, we have a better understanding of how to assess those trade-offs. Economics can help you do that a little bit. Um, but I do want to underscore that economics isn't the only thing, really ever, that you should use uh, to make a decision. It is one way of doing it. There are things that are very hard to monetize. There are values and conditions and uh, gauntlet kinds of issues that we deal with that uh, really aren't terribly uh, amenable to economic assessment. And by the way, the, the caption there for YAP, uh, money was not piled on top of people to punish them. I just made that up. Right? So one of the problems we have uh, with traditional economics is that we assume that people are always rational in their decision making. And it's by no surprise to anyone on the line that that's not always the case. Apologies to Daniel Kahneman for, for stealing his question, but uh, one of the things we do in some of our long-range planning work where the biggest challenge is getting people out of their heads, uh, understanding that what they see today is not the same as what they would have seen there in the same spot 20 years ago and probably not what they'll see in 20 more years in the future. And most people would answer this question very quickly and they would think that the correct answer is um, um, B, 10 cents, because they're doing simple math. A dollar 10 minus a dollar is, is 10. Unfortunately, that's not the right answer. When I noticed in other presentations in front of people, I've counted the uh, responses and about 95% of the people will get this question wrong. Uh, the answer is actually five cents, and I'll let you do the math on it. But people aren't rational. There's a number of ways that they're not rational. Um, these are different kinds of things. Framing, you know, how you approach a problem actually uh, matters an awful lot in how you, you end up uh, with your solution set. Many times as we scope out projects and think about things like that in the transportation world, urban design world, uh, sometimes the answers are somewhat embedded, so we are, we are victims to framing a problem a little bit. Loss aversion. Uh, think about how you feel when someone, you're sending a line in the grocery store, let's say, and someone leaves the line in front of you and goes to get something else, and, um, and that makes you feel maybe something, maybe you won't even notice that. But if someone came out of nowhere and cut in line right in front of you, how does that make you feel? In reality, you're just changing one position, forward or back, it's the same unit. Economics would say that you feel the same. That's not true for people. Uh, prospect theory and future discounting are interesting because they almost say the opposite thing in some ways. People love to prospect. They, they want to believe they're going to be the big winner and they're willing to, to wager on that at a higher level than what you know, rationality would dictate. We also do future discounting. You, know, you want the good stuff now that you enjoy and you understand, uh, but you know, 
getting healthy and, and you know, culture can wait a little bit, and for most people there's a temptation to do that. Economics traditionally has also assumed that, econ that information is perfect. Um, that's not true, of course, and in fact, uh, you often tend to ignore uh, what you uh, aren't expecting to see. Um, behavioral economics is the kind of umbrella term for some of these things, and I would encourage you, if you do find yourself interested, even after this presentation, to think about e behavioral economics as a good you know, entry point. It's a fascinating uh, topic and a lot of fun and uh, helps provide some insights into some of your behavior and your friends and your mates. Again, many times when we go into the community, sometimes we're surprised by the lack of, either the lack of interest or even um, angst or anxiety or even downright anger about what we're proposing because people are fearing change a bit. Um, but also remember that in many communities and uh, probably for many people on the line in your community, uh, the recession uh, that we are just now really getting out of a little bit is, is bad. And it, kind of, it still is for a lot of people. The memory is still quite fresh. You know, the housing market hasn't recovered. Um, there's been a lot of ancillary pain you know, dumped on families and individuals uh, from stress. And uh, those are things we deal with out there in the world, uh, uh, not just you know, mobility and, and urban design and so forth. Um, so why do this economic analysis? Sustainability. Uh, um, certainly economics is one of the three pillars of that uh, sustainability cause. Defining social equity, defining equity kind of solutions, also very important. Creating wealth in the community and understanding how the design of a project or an area or a community can actually influence you know, business decisions from out of town and so forth. Those things are kind of important to people. Uh, return on investment can address, can address those things or help to do that. Local priorities. Um, most of the places we work in now across the country, uh, cities and states and certainly federal government, um, all tend to look at performance measurement and um, economic returns and things like that as kind of a core part of the mission these days. Uh, that's how they um, choose to, to weight and prioritize projects. Uh, so local priorities and state priorities and even national priorities are another reason we find ourselves doing this kind of work. Mahatma Gandhi said that action expresses priorities. How many times have you been in a situation where you're making a, a pitch for your project or you're talking to people about your project and someone says, you know, I think that's a great project, but, you know, we just don't have the money to do that right now. I have worked in many different communities, looked at many different financial statements and capital improvement programs, and never have I seen one where the value is zero. Um, they all have dollars. We all have some amount of money in dollars. It's how we choose to spend those dollars, how we choose to expend those resources. Part of the mission, I suppose, today then is uh, helping to put projects and, and, and behaviors and health impacts and other kinds of things on the playing field so that you can be evaluated along with other things that uh, communities are making hard decisions about. Uh, and that's, again, many times what we find to be the case is that, you know, we are competing against uh, everything from, you know, police cars to new sewer lines and things, and uh, our projects may or may not suffer from uh, not being able to uh, quantify their benefits as well. This image is actually a, a map uh, found uh, of I-65 overlaid on a 1950 map um, in Indianapolis. And though at that era, the, the 50s and 60s particularly, uh, we were thinking a lot about um, benefits to mobility and, and not quite as much weighing the, the disbenefits of some of the construction um, that has left uh, in many communities kind of a legacy of, of uh, frankly, distrust about decision making. Um, and so uh, moving forward a little bit in our presentation, we're going to get into, you know, how we can avoid making some of those mistakes or how we can uh, put our project into a, uh, a good and accurate light. The basics of how we do this, and um, I hope you're, you're tuning in uh, to get kind of a good grounding here. Um, I, it's very unlikely that I'll answer your specific question about your specific project during my presentation. You can always write in questions at, during the presentation, obviously, but the basics are here, and we'll cover that a little bit so you understand how, how we approach uh, at Stantec and I approach uh, economic analysis. Uh, five, five big steps. You know, finding the project, understanding where it's at, uh, the schedule for its construction, the benefit categories. You know, who is it benefiting and why do you think they might be getting uh, some benefits from this? You know, travel time and safety, access to jobs and job training, schools, all kinds of things uh, we've looked at. Um, 
And how do you how quantify those benefits? Once you think you know kind of the rough categories, how do you begin to assess the benefits? We'll spend a little bit more time on step three than the others because that's, I think, where people get a little bit disenchanted or a little bit nervous about the process. And then quantifying the cost. Usually this is easier. Um, we usually, for an individual project, have a set cost. But it can be challenging too. Um, and then answering and refining and presenting the information in step five. And we'll cover each of those now. So step one, uh, defining the project. You know, is our project uh, our complete street in a urban, suburban, or rural area? You know, bigger, longer projects are great because they tend to have a bigger uh, impact footprint. They can benefit more people, more communities, more businesses, whatever your uh, service area is. Uh, but they also obviously cost more. So when we think about the benefits as opposed to the cost, uh, those are trade-offs we tend to already think about even this very first step of the process. Um, also, understanding when the project would begin. You know, uh, when does construction end, and when does um, you know the service begin on or, or with the project? When do the benefits really start? So, step two: Who is the project trying to serve? Um, how do the people travel now? How do they move about this area now? Are we changing potentially the way people um, move? Are they gonna, more people going to be using transit, for example, or more people walking or biking? Um, are there safety concerns and issues now? Does it have a, does the project area have a very high crash rate going on along its length or at one, one or two points? We need to understand because if we do safety improvements as part of our complete street project, the number of crashes may go down. Step three. Um, um, so the benefits um, uh, in more detail. So. The, I kind of think in my head of, of two different categories of benefits in a big way. There's the, the stuff that happens during construction. You know, people have to build it. They're getting paid. They spend money elsewhere in the community. Those things are typically answered through standard input-output models, um, which we'll touch on in a little bit. But oftentimes, the biggest challenge is understanding for the years after the project's construction and in service. Uh, that's where we get a, you know, have to be more creative in our understanding of how the project works and more detailed, perhaps, in some ways. New expanded businesses, um, uh, crash reductions, as I said, economic opportunities and social equity issues. These can often be a little bit more challenging to, to get at. You know, hopefully it's not just a numbers exercise. I have a colleague that once told me um, in his community that you know, we don't want to turn, I think it was a transportation project, we don't want to turn this transportation project or our community into a math problem. And I hope that's not the way you perceive this exercise today. But, um, we really want to understand on the ground, talking to people, surveys, what, you know, what is their issues, what's the constraints we're under. Quantifying the cost, certainly the capital cost for construction, right of way, engineering. All these things are typically done as part of a project even during preliminary and conceptual design phases. Um, maintenance operations cost, hopefully from local sources. I'll probably say this more than once, but I think local sources are really crucial. Increases the credibility of your project uh, with your with your clients, with your community, um, we try to do that whenever we can and rely upon national or other sources uh, uh, when we cannot do that. Uh, many of you are, are maybe thinking about grant programs or have uh, submitted applications for grants. And I think that uh, understanding the cost is important, but also kind of the breakout of the cost is important. Who's paying for what? How much is, much are you paying for this? How much is the grant sponsor paying for it? Is there private sector contributions for part of this? All of these things may dictate how you view, um, view cost matters in, the, in your project at step four. And then lastly, once you have all the information and you've done some of the math work, uh, uh, it's really thinking about presenting it. And uh, you know, I've talked a couple of times already about presenting a project in a good light. Uh, that for me doesn't mean, you know, quote unquote, spinning a project, but it, it really means making sure you're accurate and presenting the information in a way that's pretty clear and understandable. Um, one other thing I'll probably say more than once is that we always try to tell a very complete story, uh, whether it's for a grant project or for an independent project, wherever we're at. We always try to make sure that people understand that there's a, a range of potential outcomes. We can't control the price of gas in 15 years. We can't do that. Um, there's a lot of potential things that could move the needle on this project. Um, but we don't stop there. Uh, we try to go even further than that. We say, well, here's the most likely scenario, here's a pessimistic, and here's an optimistic scenario. But if this, this, and this happen with your project, you're probably more likely to hit that optimistic end of 
uh, of the reading than, the, than the otherwise. So we also try to make sure that people understand there's a range of possible outcomes, and then we go that extra step and think about how can we actually design the project or plan our project to, to make sure that that optimistic outcome is a little bit more likely. This might help a little bit if we sort of walk through a couple of the steps <coughs> on an actual um, roadway. I want to thank um, Hot Springs for unwittingly um, donating um, uh, East Grand Avenue for our talk today. But um, I made up the land use numbers here, so hopefully no one will, will write in about that uh, down in Arkansas. But uh, think about the project a little bit just in the beginning. Uh, we think design and construction will happen in 2019, 2020. Um, there's a range of land uses on it. Uh, the length is uh, just short of two miles long. Um, it's not necessarily a congestion issue yet. So even at this early stage, as you can think about these kind of very basic numbers, uh, kind of thinking about, well, congestion right now isn't an issue. Are we thinking it'll be worse later? Um, how will this impact, say, benefits from travel time and congestion, uh, lost time? Uh, and right now, at least in this early out, outset of this project, it looks like maybe travel time may not be as big a factor as is good in some other projects. One thing you see at the bottom is the cost is $16.3 million. They estimated from the preliminary design back in 2012. That's the first issue and the first kind of math that we do is bring that to a more up-to-date number. Um, and it turns out that it's really worth about $17 million in 2017. So we want to make sure that all of our costs and benefits uh, that we monetize anyway, uh, are, are using current uh, year dollars uh, to make things easy to understand and pair apples to apples. A little bit more uh, Grand Avenue, uh, thanks to Google and Hot Springs for this one. Uh, East Grand Avenue, um, if you look at the picture on the right, um, you can learn a lot about a project by going out there and walking it. I try to walk every single project we do. I'll ride my bike through it and take a lot of pictures. Uh, in this particular picture, you can see Utility poles right up against the edge of pavement, or the back of curb almost. You can see a very worn path, walking path on the right-hand side. And you can see they already have a nice treed median. So there's some uh, aesthetic elements, at least, that are kind of in place. Um, I made up some of these things, but you know, fewer advanced degrees in the area. A couple of public schools, a, a higher than average jobless rate. Um, but Grand Avenue does link to jobs and a job training center, so that's kind of valuable. Um, partially within open historic districts, there may be some benefits or some constraints there. Uh, some of the businesses, uh, there are in a lot of communities, unfortunately, are, are facing some turnover and some changes. Um, so some of the benefits we can think of right away, you know, the access to jobs is a potential uh, benefit category. More walking and biking, obviously, or at least facilitating what's going on there. Uh, if there's transit in the corridor, then improving transit ridership because uh, of better access uh, could also be a, an important design consideration and an important um, benefit. And reducing crashes, uh, usually a benefit in almost every single project we do. I uh, don't want to ignore it here uh, for this imaginary one. So benefit calculations, fun with numbers. So we've thought about this a little bit, construction, job productivity, fewer crashes and more walking. So if we break it down just a little bit more, um, we think about wages, you know, temporary and permanent, or temporary jobs from the construction, the wages, the tax benefits uh, that might be happening from all of that. Jobs, uh, we talked about the access to the job training center, higher, better paying jobs because of that uh, experience and exposure that people get. Um, crash reductions, walking. Obviously, not everybody that uh, lives or works adjacent to this project will be accruing all these benefits. Uh, so part of the challenge is always to try to understand um, how you can um, understand, get, the, get a good fix on the number of people that will be enjoying this, these benefits. So wages and things are, as I mentioned earlier, really uh, nicely handled or adequately handled by some models that are out there. I've used all the ones listed there, implant, Tretus, uh, RIMS. Um, many times, though, we just have uh, flat coefficients. So if I remember correctly, the last Tiger Guidance had about 70, every $73,000 worth of um, project expense equated to one job. <laughs> so it's a very, very simple kind of flat multiplier, um, but, uh, or one job year. Uh, crash reductions, so there have been some studies uh, looking at how different kinds of treatments reduce crashes of different kinds. It's nice if you can figure out what is actually causing the crashes and then uh, address the treatments and the design appropriately. That usually happens anyway, but understanding that as an, as an analyst or a planner is a good idea. Um, 
you know, labor. So uh, downstream things, even after the construction happens, more people are using this to access jobs. They have easier access. They're, they're using that. They have more time, perhaps, to spend on training. Uh, walking, you know, health studies um, are valuable there. Um, there are a lot of different studies, one-off studies, looking at the health benefits. It's a tricky one to get at. It's an important one. I don't want to downplay it. However, you're kind of seeing health benefits through the lens of preventing certain kinds of um, heart-related or health-related, uh, other health-related kinds of diseases, uh, and then translating that into um, years of, of lost life and lost productivity. So it's almost a two- or three-step process to get at some of these, but um, that's kind of what you're thinking about as you, as you move through this process. I very quickly touched on before the value of ground truthing. I think the best projects I've worked on are the ones where I've had an opportunity to talk to people in the community and understand from them how many people are using the facility and in what way now, um, and getting a ground truth uh, kind of exercise from people in the community and the business community. Um, if you do this, you know, and you know, understanding how that might impact their designs on expansion. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can work with the community up front to kind of uh, improve your results and improve the credibility, improve the story you're telling about your project. Case studies. Case studies are great. Um, they're very easy to understand. The biggest problem I see with case studies that people tend to do over and over again, the case studies either aren't very similar to what you're doing or there have been kind of post project things that happen um, uh, after the project is done that really make it a, a different kind of animal than what you're studying. So make sure you really uh, do your homework on getting case studies that, that make sense. Um, successes, you know, not everything can be monetized. We need to think about this beyond the number of benefit cost ratio or whatever. Um, talk about ways, as I've said before, about improving outcomes. You know, if we add lighting to the project, that extends its useful service life. Um, for many more hours or a couple more hours of the day. Uh, it helps school kids um, uh, see better at the bus stop and things like that. So all these things are kind of things to think about in conjunction with uh, uh, designers and engineers to, to work together with you on, on uh, think about these things very early on in the project life. Here's another project example. This was actually for a rail reactivation study that, uh, uh, give a kudo here to NCDOT. Uh, that we worked on for them. We did not just the model effort, uh, looking at jobs and wages and travel time and secondary benefits, uh, but also we surveyed face-to-face uh, -face or telephone into telephone a lot of people. Uh, and we also looked at peer studies, did very detailed peer studies of uh, several different agencies that had done similar work in the past. So summarizing and presenting the information, this is three of those other case studies, the Blue Ridge Scenic Railway in blue and then the Durban and Greenbrier in green, another one in red. Um, all these things that you see in the right are different kinds of, um, uh, I guess, characteristics. And so we didn't stop at just a number, right? We, as I said, we kind of looked at how these other entities, all these other, other uh, rail services in this case, have really focused on different things to make their service a success. So you're kind of giving uh, your community or your client, if you're a consultant, um, you know, different ideas on how to make the project success, not just a flat, you know, benefit cost number. And so this is important, and this, I think, is what um, uh, we've seen a lot of appreciation and value come back to us when we've done things like this. Capital maintenance. Okay, so now we're getting into a little bit of the cost issue. Capital cost, most of the projects that we work on, the capital costs are fairly straight, straightforward. Um, one of the things we do try to break out, if you're going to be using one of these models, they prefer to see uh, materials broken out in certain ways and different kinds of labor, like let's just say design engineering up front and then the actual labor of the people building the road um, and the, or the sidewalk or the greenway or whatever it is they're doing. Um, it's nice to break those things out separately. These models tend to like that. It gives you a little bit tighter number. Maintenance cost. Uh, you can often get maintenance costs um, from local government people. Uh, people that do the maintenance, uh, if you can't, there are some you know, external sources that are valuable. Uh, whatever you do when you get your numbers, make sure you're expressing your numbers in current year dollars. Uh, and that's fairly easy to do. Uh, there are consumer price index um, factor adjustments and other sources you can use to kind of have a discount rate uh, for your project. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Well, you've done all this work in your spreadsheet. This is actually a section of one of my very own spreadsheets on the left-hand side of the slide. 
and you kind of see some of the numbers, some of the inputs, things like that uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, some of these projects I've worked on are, are very much complete streets. They really think about biking, walking, transit. Uh, some only think about parts of those, uh, not all at once necessarily. Um, so you're thinking about this and you um, are thinking about the net present value. Um, one thing you think about, particularly if you've been through the Tiger Grant process, is this idea of discounting uh, revenues. And one of the discount values you know, pr you know, promulgated by the Tiger Grant process um, is a 7% value. And that really has a, a big impact on your revenues in 20 or 25 years. A dollar now might only be worth about 25 cents in 20 years. So don't assume that you know, a great benefit stream right now will always be there for you in 20 years. Discount rate, discount rates hurt. <laughs> Um, the benefit cost ratio is a way of expressing those values. So it's simply all the revenues for a time period divided by all the cost. It's pretty easy, I found, for decision makers to understand. The benefit cost ratio of two um, suggests that you suggests that you um, get two dollars return for every dollar of investment. Um, so people get that. I've never had someone come back and say to clarify that. It seems pretty simple. We use another one too called a payback period that I think decision makers really appreciate, uh, especially elected officials. Um, and basically it's very simple. It's just a um, period of time that it takes the revenues to catch up to the cost. Uh, and so if you have a payback period of seven years, after seven years you begin to realize uh, net benefits from your project. And again, it's pretty easy for people to understand. There are more exotic um, kinds of metrics, internal rate of return and so on. Uh, much harder to explain. You know, keep things relatively simple and ask, get your, get your, uh, your, your audience to give you the details uh, and the questions later on. Summarize and be succinct in your work. And always show your work. Um, you know, the, the next slide here, the next piece of this, I switched over. Uh, I can guarantee you, I don't know who you are out there, but I can guarantee you in a year you will not remember the source of where you got this or that figure or that multiplier or whatever it is you're looking at. And so having you know, pretty detailed notes, even inside, if you're using a spreadsheet, for example, um, that will help you understand where you got it from. And I try to be, I've learned painfully to be as specific as I can in all my note taking here. Um, I know some people find that to be very difficult, but I promise you it will pay off benefits. If there's one thing you walk away from uh, this uh, talk with, I hope it's <laughs> in part that. No matter how much you uh, do this, I find that you know, you're always tempted to rush through things or maybe the time or the budget or the, the effort just isn't there or the, the data isn't there. And so we kind of run into problems a little bit too. So we'll touch on that here. <clears throat> the first one is you know, this idea of money. I, I was, on purpose, I talked about how money for me is really not the point. Uh, it's a way of kind of capturing value. However, some things it's very hard to capture. Uh, we talked about the health benefits can be, uh, you know, it's, some of the work that's been done academically now is better. Uh, it's very hard to, to get local data for that still at a, at a micro level. So monetizing results can be hard a little bit. Uh, messing up the basics. Uh, the little blue chart at the top that just popped up with the arrow pointing down. The arrow pointing down is uh, a sudden blip in revenues that appeared and not from one of my projects, I want to hasten to add that. Uh, the grant review that I was doing for this did not explain why the revenue suddenly jumped up by a factor of nearly three at one point uh, in the revenue stream. Uh, did they add another train, another bus? You know, what happened there? Um, always be clear. That was for a grant project, I will say, and that grant project actually was awarded, so you don't have to be perfect, don't worry. Messing up the details. Uh, you know, knowing a little bit about economics uh, is obviously very, very helpful. Um, it, it should not be a barrier, though, to, to getting into this. I hope that's not the case. We'll talk about at the end about how to get into this subject matter in more detail. Um, there are some things like transfer benefits, understanding if you're doing a grant, how that grant sponsor talks about transfer benefits. Um, just because you're um, uh, um, you know, enjoying a benefit from getting dollars to do your project here, you may be hurting someone far, far away because they didn't get the money that you did. And so uh, that is kind of on balance, sort of a net wash. Uh, depending if you're talking about the local government, you may be doing more of an economic impact analysis where you're just concerned with locals and you don't care what happened in somewhere else. You just want to you know, think about what's happening in your community. 
So that can be a little bit different depending on the kind of project, the kind of um, uh, audience you're, you're playing to. The discount rate I've already mentioned, how it can be difficult to overcome. Communication I think is really important. You know, writing it well, clearly, and briefly is, is always a good idea. I'm going to wrap up here in about uh, five minutes or so to make sure we have time for questions. So the art of the chart. I've certainly made a lot of mistakes with charts. Um, simpler is always, always good. Uh, Edward R. Tuft, a book that I lean on quite often, you know, make sure your data ink ratio is very high. <laughs> uh, make sure you're showing people the data they, they need to see, you want to convey, and a lot of, a lot of extra stuff. And there are some good examples of how you know, maps use high contrast or some interesting visual elements with infographics that people seem to be using quite a bit now that go a little bit beyond the chart. When numbers fail you, we mentioned a couple of times already that um, the benefit cost ratio isn't the whole story. So always do the work. We find that people uh, put much more credence in projects that have already had some preliminary design done on them, so we know the cost a little bit more tightly maybe even going all the way through higher levels of design, permitting, things like that. People have gotten creative. Uh, we've seen you know, people create project websites for a project, uh, even at the very early stages, um, you know, doing renderings like some of the ones we've seen in this presentation, presenting a picture of, of how the project would look before and after can do much more than an economics number. And always document support. And always understand who's behind your project to make sure that people are, that are having to make very hard decisions out there understand that it's not just you talking to them, it's actually a lot of people in your community talking to them too. Okay, so how do you get started? The uh, American Economics Association, AEA, is a wonderful value at $40 per membership for a year. That's pretty good. Federal Highway Administration, believe it or not, has some really good resources out there uh, because of, uh, in large part, the Tiger Grant program that's gone on for a few years now. Uh, Houston Qua is one of the authors. There are many others that are, that are really wonderful though. Ask questions of people like me. Ask questions of the, if you're doing a grant or if you're talking to um, someone that's kind of done this work before. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Always important. Always cite your data, as we said. Go local when you can. Uh, other resources, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, if you haven't looked at the business census online, uh, just Google LEHD and you'll be just wonderfully surprised. Um, we at Santec have some other resources that get a bit more um, into this, it does cost money as you move down the ladder here, or up the ladder. Uh, things like online research libraries, Scopus, if you don't have a license to some of these things, find a college student, they usually do through college. Um, the Esri Business Analyst Online is a wonderful way of slicing data and getting access to data that is relatively cost effective. Third party data, if people think of Woods and Pool here, Woods and Pool is great, it tends to go down to the county level and not much further, so it may not help you with a smaller project. Um, other uh, resources like CoStar we've started using more and more often uh, that look at uh, very good or at least very detailed, they purport <laughs> the retail data and other sources like that can be very valuable. You, know, you probably have some local sources I'm not listing here. So um, think about your sources and, and work on it. There is no single source. We do a lot of research for every single project. There is no magic bullet uh, that I go to on uh, every single one. It really is kind of a unique research effort. Um, on every single one of these that we do an economic return on. So um, that's what we're thinking about. If all that fails, uh, just give, give me a call and uh, we'll be happy to talk to you. Um, we and many others do this kind of uh, work, or at least some others do this kind of work. Uh, don't be afraid to, to scope around. People like us love talking about this stuff, <laughs> as you can tell and uh, we're happy to answer those questions. So I'm going to turn this back over to Deborah and let her and others there kind of uh, walk us through some of your questions. And thank you for your time and attention in advance. Well, thank you, Scott. That was excellent from really the high level conceptual to the down uh, nitty gritty practical things. We have a lot of interest and a lot of questions. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, the first question, how do you quantify costs that are not inherently quantifiable such as more walkable environment, healthy community, better mobility for the poor and elderly, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned a couple of times there that it, it's also a very hard one. <laughs> uh, and I also mentioned it's kind of a unique research effort. Um, one possible source I try to eliminate very quickly, um, chambers of commerce sometimes do surveys locally of uh, people that are visiting uh, and staying in hotels and how they're using that space, how they're, you know, are they getting out and walking. Um, it's really good 
to work with people like that are doing that kind of survey work uh, to help them kind of augment their surveys in the future. Uh, we don't just work with the business community when we need them. Uh, we're trying to make sure we're kind of planning to see that they're giving us data at some point down the road. I've had that happen a few times. It's wonderful when it does happen. If you can't get that, as I mentioned, there's sort of a research effort involved um, where you begin to think about um, the community, uh, you know, the, the relative, uh, the, the best, or I guess the, the main source that people use is journey to work data, which has issues. I won't go into a lot of that as a smaller sample size for, for some uses. Uh, it does talk about a little bit on uh, uh, what people are doing in terms of getting back and forth to work, which is a really good one to use, particularly if you're using thing, the information for things like Tiger. Um, you know, you typically apply a percentage of people you know, that are, are walking to work in a, in a highly walkable area and then transferring that data back to your area that maybe isn't as walkable now, but you're thinking uh, that it will be more than that one day. One thing I'm very cautious about is really identifying a range of outcomes, and there have been a range of outcomes of research in that. We're doing a project right now in Ohio where we're actually, uh, myself and a colleague are looking at a project in Ohio where we're surveying uh, 29 different um, uh, greenway projects or side paths in Ohio and looking at the actual real world results in terms of uh, the economic benefits. So sometimes you get lucky and you're able to do the extra work. So external sources are you know, your fallback position there. Um, a lot of times the, the real results uh, when you get serious about it, are you know somewhere between you know two, three, four, five, six percent <coughs> change in that corridor. There are cases where it could be higher, particularly if the land uses are really complementary to walking. It's great to have sidewalk, but it's even better to have places that are connected by sidewalk. Uh, so part of that is the context and the framework that you're you're thinking about. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question. Can you use these economic analyses for projects that don't cost anything, for example, to justify lowering a speed limit on a street? Yeah. So, and I didn't put the link in here, and I should be punished for that, but there's actually some research done that I tend to go to fairly often, uh, Federal Highways Online document, that looks at different kinds of safety benefits from different kinds of treatments, and it's remarkably detailed, as I recall. Um, I, I'm, I'm 99% sure that speed limit reductions is one of those. Uh, maybe we can post that in the notes section of the slides so that we can give them the link for that. That's one of the few sources I've seen out there for that kind of thing. Um, you could certainly look at you know, different roadways, uh, if that's your project that you're thinking about, um, and thinking about you know, if you can collect data on crashes from different kinds of roadways that are like yours but already have a lower speed limit. Um, and thinking about what the differentials and crash rates are for those different kinds of facilities, that can be useful. Thank you. <coughs> and, uh, staff here will look for that Federal Highway publication and include it in the uh, list of materials after the, that everybody gets uh, sent after the uh, webinar is over. That's um, lovely. I can shoot it to you and you'll, you'll definitely have it. Terrific. Next question is, how do you convince government officials to invest in complete streets rather than new ones? And how do you deal with the influence of developers and property speculators? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I guess that's pretty context specific or project specific, but I guess in general what we're trying to do here is um, enumerate the advantages we said of your project. And I think that is one of the underlying issues we all face with complete streets. Many times the street's already there, right? Uh, we're just trying to do something that makes it better. <coughs> it's hard to cut a ribbon on a sidewalk. Um, but I think that uh, as communities are looking around more and understanding that their, their resources are very limited. Um, Deborah, uh, you said it very well at the beginning, um, you know, these projects aren't as expensive usually as the projects on new location. Uh, that's a very important thing. So if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison of a new project, um, you're really handling traffic that's being handled somewhere else now, right, uh, in terms of cars. Uh, anyway, uh, so you know your your benefits from the new location may actually not be as great as people think if we consider the cost. So um, doing a side by side comparison in that case might be really useful, and you can do those actually fairly quickly. A lot of demos will be the same um, if you have a um, an existing street or maybe a parallel corridor. Um, once you have one set of numbers, a lot of those inputs will end up being quite similar. So it'd be very quick to do a you know kind of a trade off kind of comparison. 
Okay. Um, next question, how does climate, uh, for example, cold temperatures for large portions of the year, and therefore fewer bicyclists and pedestrians, uh, how does that affect cost-benefit analyses? Right. I think you're going to ask me a question about climate change, and I've learned recently there is no such thing as climate change. So I would <laughs> understand the question. Um, you know, uh, it's a very good question, and several things that we talked about context up front, and I probably should have touched on things like topography and climate. Uh, certainly, again, looking at things like maintenance costs, downstream maintenance costs, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, and it really ends up impacting your, your 2025 year um, revenue stream or your net revenue stream uh, because the maintenance costs we find in a lot of communities that are, are hilly or mountainous or, or have climate conditions that have a lot of freeze-thaw cycles, or even these days it's really very very hot weather for longer periods of the year because there actually is climate change. Um, those things are now influencing that cost stream quite differently than you would in a, in a more temperate climate. Um, I'm located in North Carolina, and while you think that might be the most temperate place in the world, it's certainly a nice day today, we have mountains, we have coastal areas that are have very different kinds of parameters, and we respect that all of our little cost spreadsheets uh, <laughs> define four different kinds of topography, for example. So uh, we are quite sensitive to changes uh, in, in those factors, and it definitely, has a fa it definitely has an influence. You shouldn't use a case study, for example, as we talked about earlier, um, for one kind of area like that uh, that uh, is in a different kind of climate condition or a different kind of topography. That is you know, hopefully a, a good no-no to, to watch out for. Okay. Okay, um, next question. Have you ever used different discount rates for different cost components? For example, societal costs of safety could have a 0% discount rate because the general public doesn't value a traffic fatality differently from one year to the next. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting topic, right? I mean, so we have the unpleasant, I guess it is kind of a dismal science, right? When you think about um, quantifying people's lives and, or, or years of life lost, it can get a bit depressing. But um, I would respond first by saying that, you know, it depends on whose life is being lost. If it's you or someone you care about, then it's of infinite value. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that is a good point. I think you convert these things, I guess it's good and bad. You convert all these things into numerical quantities so you're not really you're trying to remove some of that perception out of the game, um, which hopefully most times will be a, a benefit to your decision-making process uh, because you're getting some of the you know, perspective out of it a little bit. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, we have done things, for example, quantifying uh, the value of time. There's been pretty good research on uh, people who value their time sitting still waiting for the bus a lot differently than they do when they're in motion. Uh, sometimes a factor of two or three to one. Uh, that value of time, when you multiply it by their typical wage rate in the community, um, can be quite high. Um, pedestrians, I, you know, I tend to like valuing the time of, in some ways, of pedestrians higher, which is obviously very relevant to complete streets because pedestrians are more exposed to weather. Uh, they are um, more sensitized to the environment uh, than others driving a car with the radio turned on and things like that. So. Um, there is certainly a good justification uh, if you can make it, and it, usually you can make it pretty easily for valuing things differently depending on different kinds of users, uh, if that helps answer the question. Okay. okay, thank you. Now our last question is, how do we start to have conversations about complete streets with our neighbors given that people are not always rational uh, as we learn from behavioral economics? Hmm. I think you should show them that question that we did, you know, the baseball and the baseball bat. I, I would find that a good entree. I think people are always surprised. And I know when I first read it, I was very surprised. Uh, there's some really lovely uh, behavioral economics party tricks that we do <laughs> with people to help them kind of shake up their mindset. And as Kahneman would have said, you know, thinking a little bit slower, more carefully about problems. There does tend to be, you know, we live in a very <clears throat> uh, polemic kind of society. Perhaps we always did. It's more obvious now thanks to more communication mechanisms. But uh, I think it is, uh, a, you know, one of the potential wonderful benefits of leaning on economics a bit to help um, uh, take some of the, um, the angst out of these discussions to help uh, people understand the value. And I'd rather have them, you know, debating the value of walk time or the value of, um, you know, a crash reduction than I would about 
um, than debating the value of doing complete streets across an entire community. I think it's very, I think it's much easier to understand and get a grip and have a healthy debate on the specifics that you know play into the decision than it is these big overarching decisions themselves. And I think that, uh, uh, as I said, this is one of the great things potentially about this kind of assessment or thinking about things in this kind of way uh, that could be a real benefit to our communities and getting people kind of stuck off center. Um, at least that's been, you know, that's been our experience in some of these, some of these projects we've worked on. Yeah, yeah that's a great suggestion, Scott. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really hope you've learned a lot from this, this wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, well, there are a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to, but we will include them and the answers to them in the recap uh, email that you will get about the uh, webinar with a link to the uh, recording of the webinar and the presentation slides, uh, and that should come in the next week or so. Um, and we'll hope you, we hope you'll also join us for the next two webinars in the series. Uh, in celebration of National Public Health Week, the next webinar will be held on Wednesday, April 5th. The co-host will be the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, who will join us in exploring the intersection of complete streets, Vision Zero, and transportation equity. The webinar will focus on Memphis's experience with these initiatives and feature speech speakers from Livable Memphis and the Memphis Medical District. Registration is now open. And then in May, the webinar will focus on making the most of Main Street. Ian Thomas, the state and local program director at America Walks, will join us to examine how complete streets can help create thriving, walkable communities. Stay tuned for the registration link. That's it for today. Thank you.